I am so excited today. We are making something that I have been cooking for years, but I also brought it back into the house for the last couple of weeks because we have had record high temps here and sometimes I just need a cold dinner. So a couple bites of leftovers and a quick version of Zaru Soba, a traditional cold Japanese buckwheat noodle dish made with a soba tsuyu sauce for dipping. Uh, but I have my own twist on it and I think you're gonna really like it. This is both very traditional, but I'm also like making lasagna with spaghetti. We, if, if, if we were to be analyzed by real uh, Japanese chefs. Um, but I think that you will excuse um, the, uh, the swapping around. Uh, Japanese noodle sticklers will say, well, you should not serve somen noodles with a cold tsuyu uh, and recreate zarusoba. But I found that there are actually whole groups of Japanese chefs that do for a very specific reason. We'll get into that later. It's cold noodles today on Instagram Live, AZ Cooks, thanks to the good folks at Flor de Cana and at uh, Shun Cutlery. Um, so, how's everyone been? Been having a good weekend? You had a good week? Getting excited about this weekend? I am all around. Um, Tired though, it's been a whole bunch of really, really long days that have started early, so excuse me if I'm sipping a nice iced espresso, which is my late afternoon drink of choice. So let's talk about this for a second before we start making uh, things. I'm gonna gently pop my water uh, temperature up here. Um, like so many dishes in the uh, culinary pantheon of so many different cultures, if you don't have the goods on hand, you can't cook it, right? Uh, so I order foods like crazy online. Uh, this is not a plug. I have no relationship with Amazon. Um, Amazon carries everything. And they have links to all kinds of stuff, external resources. There's also cultural, culinary specific online stores, uh, Japanese super supermarkets uh, on the coasts, especially in the Los Angeles area, especially in the San Francisco area, the New York area, that carry all of this stuff and it'll be at your door in 24 hours. H Mart has an online uh, component. That's an uh, Asian superstore uh, in the grocery business. Um, and we have some fantastic local markets here, and I know that you do where you live um, as well. So unless you live in the middle of Yellowstone Park, there is an Asian market near you that is selling these because while they seem arcane to you right now, they're actually fairly run of the mill and you need them to cook Japanese food. Um, now, if you're cooking Chinese food, you kind of, there are Chinese superstores, but Chinese food is so deep and wide and monstrous. I have places that I go for Cantonese ingredients and places that I go for uh, Sichuan ingredients like uh, Mala Market out of uh, Nashville. I just placed a big order with them uh, yesterday. It's my absolute go-to. Um, and it obviates the need for me going back and forth to uh, markets here in town. Um, so. There you have it. Uh, so let's talk about some of our building blocks here. Well, well, first let's talk about the dish itself. Um, these are somen noodles, which is a wheat noodle that has a little bit of sweet potato starch in it. And that's going to come into play very, very soon when I actually make this dish. It's why I have this big bowl of ice here, much bigger than we should, but this is, you know, show and tell time. I usually just use a handful or two for every uh, portion. And I use a basket like this to cook the noodles in because it's easier to submerge the noodles into an ice bath if it's like that and not use up as much ice. Um, most of the time, the, the most, most people conceive of cold Japanese noodle dishes as beginning and ending with zaru soba. Japanese buckwheat noodles, that's them. They don't take very long to cook. They have wheat flour, buckwheat flour, water, and salt. That's all they're made of. And there's some really good brands, and they, I don't know if you could see this, but they, you see those little bands in there? They're, they're sort of 
segregated into single serving portions of noodles, so it makes it very easy uh, for you to figure out. Zaru soba is a popular dish. It's on the menu of a lot of Japanese restaurants, especially izakayas, uh, small little restaurants that serve uh, a whole variety of different styles of dishes in smaller portions focusing on uh, drinking. This is raw somen noodle, okay? Take a look at that. Now, uh, this is just one of many, many brands that I absolutely love. Um, these are made in Japan. They are imported. Um, they're made with wheat flour, salt, uh, kudzu starch, and sweet potato starch. But it's the sweet potato starch that we're most, most interested in. And that is because that starch is so, for those who eat a lot of Korean food or cook a lot of Korean food, you know where I'm going with this. When you have sweet potato starch, you have such sticky starch that when it's cooked to al dente, it has to be plunged in cold water, and doing that shocks the starch. It makes the gluten shrink. So if you get flour all over your hands and you try to wash it with hot water, it takes a while to come off because the hot water activates the gluten. If you use cold water, it rinses the flour right off. Same thing here. We're rinsing the starch off by shocking it in the ice water, and it makes the noodles super chewy and bouncy, what the Chinese call QQ. I'm sure the Japanese and the Koreans have their uh, word for that as well. Um, okay. Other thing that I like to have on hand is dashi. Now, if you want to use freeze-dried dashi that comes in little pouches from Ajinomoto, this is hun dashi. This is the all-purpose seaweed stock of Japan. You can't cook Japanese food without dashi. These are little crystals. This is a big bag of those little crystals. Uh, but this is what freeze-dried dashi looks like. I keep some at my house because sometimes I run out of dashi and I'm like, I have to have some kind of soup or I need a teaspoon to put into a braised dish. It's loaded with umami. It is made with water, kombu, which is a type of kelp, and yes, the good stuff is better than the cheap stuff. And these are uh, a type of jack tuna that's been filleted, dried and smoked, and shaved into little pieces. It is very, very potent stuff. Uh, and it, those two things together make this incredible, incredible savory rich stock that I literally could just drink on its own. Like chicken broth, if you're going to be doing Western style cooking, you have to use stocks. They're, they're used in so many different recipes. You cannot cook in the Jap Japanese kitchen without dashi, it's just impossible. So I make dashi once every couple of weeks, only takes about an hour. And by the way, all that time is waiting and cooling because you only cook this for a very small amount of time relative to other stocks. Um, and then you strain it out. So I have my homemade uh, dashi here. I wanted to show, let me show you. Do you see this piece of kombu? Oh, this piece was smaller than that when it went in. They swell up with water. But they put so many health, all that glucosamin and chondroitin that's in the seaweed goes into this stock. And you can see here those little pieces of hanakatsuo, the shaved bonito flakes that go into that stock. So you have this really, really wonderful stock. I'm going to strain that later and utilize that uh, in a dish later on for you folks. Um, sip of espresso. Um, this is a cooled two-cup measure of dashi. Um, let me get a bowl. I know, I know, I'm not there. It's okay, the world is, the world is gonna be safe, sorry, my mistake. Okay, so to make this sauce, you literally combine these six ingredients. A few cups of dashi. Japanese usukuchi shoyu, which is light colored soy sauce. Look at how light that is in comparison to what typical soy sauce looks like. Typical soy sauce is almost black. Even though this looks like typical soy sauce in the bottle because of how thick the, the bottle is, 
that's the color of the usukuchi soy, right? So you put it in there, it's very light, it tastes stronger, but it's light. Then we have mirin, that's fermented sweetened rice wine. People are familiar with that. It's a little syrupy, a little sweet, quite delicious. Just a hint of sake. By the way, you're, I think it's a tablespoon or a tablespoon and a half in what's going to be three cups worth of stuff. So if a little bit of alcohol is a problem for you for whatever reason, you can always uh, leave it out. Or you can cook a cup of sake for a few, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes, let it cool, and then use that after the alcohol is cooked out. This is a condiment that I can't live without. Brining, marinating, seasoning, browning, every kind of dish in the whole world. This is liquid shio koji. Um, this, this is a liquid distillate made from fermented rice lees. That's the spent rice that's used to make sake and other fermented rice ingredients. It's kind of syrupy. It, it doesn't smell as sweet. It's like a fermented version of mirin is the best way to kind of think about it. But it adds an unmistakable fermented flavor to this that just it makes it insanely craveable. And then this is white tamari, OK? Now, this has water, wheat, salt, and rice. Real soy sauce will oftentimes not have, in Japan, not have rice. But the tamari does. Do you ever use MSG in your cooking? I use MSG all the time. MSG is a fantastic ingredient. It exists in nature. Anything that's fermented, tomatoes have lots of MSG. Seafood, crustaceans have lots of MSG. Beer has lots. Wine has lots. Hot sauces have lots. Tomatoes have lots. I could go on and on and on. Um, I presented for three days at the International MSG Conference several years ago, um, and I will tell you the MSG scare uh, is culinary racism per uh, perpetrated against Asian peoples, especially Chinese, uh, when people started associating headaches with eating Chinese food. I will tell you right now, there is more MSG in a can of condensed soup, American brand, in your supermarket, or in so many other foods in the center aisles of your supermarket than in a bowl of anything in a Chinese restaurant. Uh, it, it's shocking to me. And many other culinarians uh, are, are on the same bandwagon that I am. MSG is good. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. More research has been done on MSG than any other food additive or ingredient in history. It's 110 years old. It's been used in countries all around the world forever. People don't get headaches. It is culinary racism and ethnocentrism at play. OK, so here we have all those ingredients for our sauce. Do I put this in the refrigerator sealed in a container? Yes. Is it good for a couple days? Absolutely. It's probably good for at least a week without the flavors flattening out. Right before I serve it, I put it in the freezer because I want it bracingly, shockingly cold just like the noodles, bracingly, shockingly cold. So I'm gonna just reserve this over here. I already have some made and it's been sitting in the freezer for about half an hour, 35 minutes, hoping that even if it develops a little ice on the top, just crack it and pour it through. You want it as cold as you possibly can. Okay, now that we've gotten our ingredients all squared away, we are literally ready uh, to make this dish. All that I wanna do is put some water in this, and this will come together in seconds. I just, and I'm, again, I am using way more ice and water than I need to, but I think it's easier on camera to be showing you bigger things than smaller things. Okay, so 
I want about three quarters of an inch of Somen noodles. This is going to happen fast. Can you guys see how thin that noodle is? They take one minute to about a minute and a half to cook. I usually pull these after a minute, but I usually taste one first. I still want them al dente because I'm going to soak them and shock them in ice water, and it's going to, um, how would I describe it? It's going to keep cooking, in a sense, in the water that's absorbed there. And all I'm doing is making sure that this dissolves the crispiness there. And I'm just gonna stir this in my boiling water. And I literally, I start counting in my head. Do these taste like sweet potatoes? They don't taste like sweet potatoes at all. In fact, these taste like uh, just a, a, a gorgeous chewy pasta. I mean, it's, it's, there's no egg in this and it's made with different ratios of water and wheat than you know flour than traditional uh italian pastas are or other noodles from other cultures um it just is i don't know there's something about somen when it's chilled because it's thin that i treasure above so many other dishes how to present this at home you want to put it in a bowl, pour some sauce over, and decorate it. By all means, go ahead, and I'll try to get to one of those uh, while I'm answering questions. This is a traditional noodle basket, and it's designed to fit on a traditional-sized plate. Just like American plates uh, come in certain sizes, generically, Butter plates, salad plates, dinner plates, same thing in other cultures. This size right here, they were not bought together, but they fit because the culture serves so many different uh, noodle dishes. By the way, I am now ready to taste perfect. So I am now plunging that into ice water. And I'm just going to add, rather than going over to my stove, I'm just going to add that. And the reason I'm doing it is that with all of this ice, that water is going to get really cold. Can you rinse this under cold water? Yes, you can. But the cold water in your sink is not 33, 34 degrees. This is. I'm just gonna let it sit that for a second to chill. What kind of kitchen gadget are you using? Uh, this is a very traditional, well, they're, sometimes they're called noodle skimmers. They sit on the edges of pots that are boiling. I have three or four of these at home. You see them in ramen restaurants. Uh, there's a European one. Italian pasta restaurants have a different pot. Their handle comes out here and not vertical. Um, but any professional chef who's ever worked in any kind of noodle restaurant, and you pop this up. Don't let the noodles fly out. Pop it out. And the water is gone. At that point, you can use, I usually use chopsticks, but I want to show everybody how easy this is. Take a portion of the soba, or sorry, of the somen. Put it there. Oh yeah, let's let's add a little more. And all I do, go around. Don't worry about any straggler pieces because you can literally just push them towards the middle. And I like to put these in the corner. I'm gonna do another portion here for you and do this two ways. Yes. Question. Where, where is your favorite noodle dish from? What country? Oh, my God. That's like saying who was 
the best kisser at sleepaway camp when you were 15. I mean, come on. That's like, that's ridiculous. I mean, so many. And it's usually always the latest experience uh, that I've had. I got to be honest with you. All right. So I have, by that I mean, when I came back from Rome the last time and I had three or four different pasta dishes at Roscioli, that to me was the greatest pasta experience. If you're out and you've just dined at Felix in Los Angeles or Missy in Brooklyn and had Evan Funky's uh, or Missy Robbins's pasta, you probably think that's the best one. If you've been down to Chicago and had Sarah Grunberg cook you pasta, you probably leave there thinking, wow, that's the best pasta I ever had. So it really depends on, I think, where you've just been. I'm in love with Chinese noodle dishes, and anyone who knows me understands that. I have dipping sauce there. All I want to season this with are scallions, and then very traditionally, some shaved nori that you just let fall from your hand and you just trust that where it goes, it's like spin art. Don't get into analysis paralysis. And you pick it up and you dip it into the sauce. And if you don't have setups like these, oh, I had a really fun point to make about my alternate setup. I'm gonna make a little bit here so I can share this with you uh, to eat. Um, I don't know if you can see how I made this one, but I had a long plate. I took a sushi rolling mat and folded it in half. That's all that is. These, by the way, cost $2. So if you like to cook chilled noodle dishes, by all means get this. These ingredients right here cost about $30 altogether. And then, by the way, with this stuff, you can make dozens of other sauces and stews and braises. All you need to do is buy like scallions and ginger and pork or chicken or whatever it is at a conventional uh, market. But these little babies are ready to go. I mean, roughly the same portion. You want to give just a couple of ounces of noodles. Um, so here is that chilled somen. And because you shocked it in ice water, it would take a while to start sticking together again. Ultimately, it will. You want to serve this immediately. The flavor, <clears throat> the flavor is out of this world. But what's so incredible to me, because it's technique driven and I'm just continually mystified at the science behind it, is how perfectly separate and chewy the noodles are because you chilled them in ice water. They are chewy, dense, springy, and separate in an addictive fashion that almost no other pasta dish, noodle dish that I eat is. It's so light. It's so cold, it's so bracingly refreshing. Um, I absolutely, I just, I can't get enough of this. I could eat this dish in the summertime every other day, all summer long, as long as it's above 80 degrees. Questions, comments, criticisms? Are, are there any proteins you'd recommend adding to this dish? No! Here's the deal, everybody wants to do the uh, hotel room service Caesar salad methodology of cooking, and I get it. And what that methodology is has been foisted upon us by a part of our culture that I find a little bit irritating. Take anything and say, for $3 more, we'll add shrimp, chicken, pork, beef, grilled salmon, you know, the foot of a Martian, a frog leg, you know, two pounds of raw onions. I mean, it's just like, not all of that goes on top of that salad that you just ordered. You don't want to ruin the simple combination of flavors here. The simplicity of this dish, it's like eating a perfect piece of melon. You don't want to ruin that flavor. That being said, if you notice the portion here, this is not a full meal. I never serve this by itself. I may serve it with a salad. I may serve it with 
a small paillard of grilled meat as a second course. I may serve it with a little braised and cooled room temperature dish where everyone gets a small portion because this many, this much noodles, while it's certainly less than entree size, is gonna fill you up a little bit. So yeah, absolutely do something else. Serve this with a, a, a Japanese style shrimp salad or chicken salad or something like that that's also cold, I think would make a wonderful, wonderful dinner. Or just, you know, chicken off the grill that you brushed with ginger and soy sauce. Could you sub rice noodles? Could you do it with rice noodles? Yeah. Yes, and you can also do it with, you know, uh, mung bean and all the rest of that kind of stuff. However, I would encourage people to order somen noodles, S-O-M-E-N, Web. the recipe is on our website. Um, but I would encourage you to order somen noodles uh, or buy them at your Asian market and buy buckwheat noodles and buy, uh, you know, Korean uh, sweet potato starch noodles and all those different things and experiment with them. There are so many phenomenal recipes uh, available to you now uh, because the entire world is available to us at the at the touch of a button on our phones or our laptops so you can see so many things and learn so many cool things. I really think that's an incredible part of cooking these days that we did not have when I was younger. If somebody's coming to Minnesota this weekend to visit, where would you recommend they eat? Mmm. Wow. Um... For sure, go to Spoon and Stable, Gavin Kaysen's restaurant. Go to Doug Flicker's Bar, uh, Bull's Horn. Have a burger or their fried chicken or their raw or any of their others. The food there is great. It's an old world bar run by a phenomenal national, nationally renowned chef. Um, uh, Sean Sherman, the sous chef, S-I-O-U-X. Uh, he and his partner just opened up uh, Awanami, uh this last week, which is the first in, am, ambitious indigenous First Peoples restaurant celebrating the foods of the, the native culture of this part of my world where I live in Minnesota that is fascinating. I can't wait to go and check that out. Um, what else? I mean, we have so many fantastic restaurants here. Um, it really depends on what you want to, what you want to eat. Uh, but I would definitely uh, check out those places uh, for sure. Um, you know, the Spoon and Stable celebrates local ingredients. Even their Italian style pasta dishes are made with heirloom species of wheat that are grown here in Minnesota. Um, but all the proteins are Minnesotan. It's a really, really cool. Um, except the halibut. It's a really, really, really cool uh, concept. What's your favorite Japanese snack? Mmm. I just did, I'm not gonna answer that question, but I am. Uh, First We Feast just dropped an episode of one of Complex's new shows that they're in partnership with called Snacked in which they take people of some renown, they put them at a table and they ask them to walk through their 10, 12 favorite snacks. And with me, they did my two or three favorite snacks from five or six different countries, and I think it's gonna blow your mind. So check it out. I just Instagrammed about it yesterday. It probably, it should have also repeated onto my uh, Twitter account. So you can just go into my timeline and see uh, or just look up First We Feast, Andrew Zimmern, Snacked. All you got to do is Google that. It'll get you right there. It is six minutes of some of the best work that I've ever done. And I'm not kidding around. It's really, I am, that particular day, I was on fire and very excited to be shooting. Uh, the producer of the show was an old friend of mine who we had worked together on a pilot uh, when she was working at ZPZ. Uh, so I spent a week with her in Mexico shooting this pilot for a show a long time ago. And she's just super smart, funny, great producer. And we just had a blast. And so I was kind of on. I hate that term. What disc have you been putting with lately? Mmm. That's a great question. Um, 
I put for years. I putted with my AVR Yeti uh, in our pro plastic. Uh, then about a year ago, I switched to my Gateway Wizards. They just felt better in my hand. James Conrad, current world champion, just gave me an advance. Caught me. They're not for sale yet. I was so blessed. I was at the tournament in Minnesota this weekend. He gave me a disc. Uh, his new Nomad. Um, his signature putter that he just developed with MVP. Can't wait to throw that. I'm probably going to try to get out there tonight. But I also ordered the new Latitude 64 Pures, um, the Kristen Tatar model. She's one of the best uh, disc golf players in the world, an incredibly talented woman. Uh, has just won two of the last three tournaments that she played in here before returning to her native Estonia. But she has a signature model putter that is supposedly fantastic, not only for putting, but for short driving, and I can't wait to throw it. Are you more of a Minneapolis or St. Paul guy? Um, I started living, F. Scott Fitzgerald had a really interesting comment about this. F. Scott Fitzgerald once said, it was 100 years ago, more. St. Paul is the last of the great eastern cities, and Minneapolis is the first of the great mediocre western ones. Now, he said this at a point in time when everything west of the Mississippi was in its nascent stages of development. L.A. wasn't L.A. Denver wasn't Denver. I mean, you just keep going on and on, right? Um, and Minneapolis wasn't Minneapolis. Uh, since F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote that at the turn of the last century, 100 and 15 years ago, um, Minneapolis has become a incredibly vibrant international city. I love living here. Um, St. Paul uh, is uh, a fit, just looks and feels different. It feels East Coast, right on down to the, the, the sandstone buildings. It's just, just a wonderful Victorian feel over there that Minneapolis does not have. Uh, so I consider them very different, even though they're the same city. They're the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, divided by the, the Mississippi River. It's, it's very, very difficult for me to understand why there's so much animosity between Minneapolitans and St. Paulites. I'm a New Yorker that moved here 30 years ago. To me, it's one fantastic city that kind of has two very distinct neighborhoods, but no one here agrees with me. I love them both. And I'm not trying to do the both sides-ism shit. Last question. Um, what is a dish you could make to impress your girlfriend's family? Like a very easy thing to make. Very easy thing to make to impress the girlfriend's family. Well, that's different than the girlfriend. Because you said the word girlfriend, I assume whoever you are, you already feel fairly confident in the relationship. So I would tell you, don't put that much pressure on yourself, right? The girl already loves you, okay? The parents are secondary. That being said, it's nice to impress maybe the future in-laws, right? So, or at least you're going to be spending time with them. It's nice to do that. So I would call them. I always ask and say, hey, do you have any allergies or any restrictions or anything? I'm making dinner. And listen to what they say, because people always reveal stuff. They'll always say, like, well, I'm not allergic to it, but I really don't care for garlic. You know, Harold, what was that dish we loved? Oh, lasagna. We love it. So all of a sudden, they're giving you cues. Maybe they like Italian food. They're not so crazy about garlic. You can lean into that. I always want to make something that's done before they ring the doorbell. You want to spend time with these people. They're going to like you, regardless of whether the food is great or good. Just have everything ready, heat it up, sit down. So things like beef stew, uh, don't stand there doing wok toss dishes and a lot of a la minute crap with your back turned to them or in the kitchen where there maybe isn't room for them to stand. Do it ahead of time. Focus on spending time with them and focus on talking to them. I know that sounded really, really, really smart. And like I know a lot about relationships. I'm just old. Th oh, thank you. Abby and Emily both are like, yeah, that was good. That was it. Do you just it's focus on the people. The world is made up of people. Speaking of which, make your people this incredible, easy, chilled somen dish with a simple, easy, traditional tsuyu to go with it. Don't put as much sauce as I did in this one. Oh well. Um, what else do we want to say? Uh, oh, 
Next week, I am going to be on a uh, retreat without access to phone or anything. So we will be having, an in we have an incredible episode that we've created just for you to air that night. Brand new content. It's going to be like, I'm just here. Nothing, you're not going to miss a beat. But I just wanted to let you know that so it's not a surprise. Please join us. Please tell your friends about this. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. Please have your friends follow us on Instagram. I'm not a beggar. I'm not needy. But we're almost at a million people. So, you know, it's like, hey, you know, let's speed it up. We're going to have a contest. We're going to roll out in September for folks uh, that's going to be really slick. And most of all, uh, be kind to one another. Wear polka dot aprons. Be okay with not being okay. What else can I tell you? I think that's it. Love you all. Thank you for supporting us. We'll see you next week.